No, maybe they got called. Is it so clear now? The sun is here to stay. Blue. Hey, Lee. Uh, Lee says, uh, for those of you who are new, my name is Steve Rode. I am, I am your uh, drone pilot today. Uh, in the chat tab, Lee Peacock asked a question, made a statement about uh, uh, flying in Durham today. There was an explosion downtown and a bunch of stuff blew up. So, uh, Lee, it's up to you now. It's on your side of things. All right, so let's get going. Um, if you can hear me, um, go ahead and type in the chat window that you can hear me, and we'll make sure that's all uh, squared away. Awesome. If you can't hear me, you just see my lips moving and my hands moving, and you have no clue what I'm talking about. Pam is here with me, the lovely Pam off screen, Hi. helping today with uh, <laughs> helping today with links and uh, answering chats and uh, posting questions and just keeping me on track. So. Let's get going. Today we're talking about radio communications. And this is something that is a, a best practices type of thing rather than a regulatory type of thing. And it's based on my experience both as an airplane pilot and a very active public safety uh, UAS pilot. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Steve Rode. I'm the chief pilot of the Wake Forest Fire Department. I'm an on-call pilot with North Carolina Emergency Management, and I'm the uh, chief pilot for North Carolina Public Safety Drone Academy. Uh, I'm also a certificated airplane instrument pilot, and I run the website at psflight.org. Uh, just to be sure that you get all the emails about upcoming classes and information, uh, I would be most appreciative if you could go into your email program and whitelist my email address. It's srode at wakeforestfire.com. And I'll give you the address at the end again. Hey, Wayne. Wayne's in Asheville. Good to see you here, Wayne. Glad you got a better signal today. All right, so here's my general disclaimer that uh, I am not the holder of all truth. And what you are about to hear is the result of my education and experience on the subject. I encourage you to constantly pursue learning and to get out there and fly and test and see what works best for you. I always reserve the right to be wrong, but I diligently try not to be. Hey, Greg, glad to uh, have you join us from Michigan. So we got the chat tab, the questions tab, and a polls tab. And what I am going to do here in the polls tab, uh, you, there will be some things for you to provide some feedback. Here's the first one coming. Uh, it's a question about who do you normally fly in support of? And in the polls tab, you should be able to vote on that right now. If you have more extended question, you can take some time and type it in the questions tab and Pam will hit me with a cattle prod and remind me to answer that. If you have a short question, you can put it in the chat tab. She's paying attention to that for me also. In the chat tab is where you're going to get uh, posted links to files and uh, websites, including the test you'll take later. And for the PDF file, uh, you can right click on the link and save it to your computer. Um, you will get continuing education credits for this class if you are a North Carolina public safety staff member. 
So you have to uh, work in public safety, law enforcement, emergency management, fire services in North Carolina to be eligible through Montgomery Community College for this class. Hey, Dan. Good to see you again. So the goal of this class is to give you an understanding of when it can be appropriate to make aviation radio calls to improve safety. And we're going to hear from some very busy news helicopter pilots. I went and shot video interviews with them. And um, I've actually communicated with them over scenes. And the process works exceedingly well. And we'll talk about what to do, what not to do, what to say, how to say it, what to use. And at the end, you will get a link where you can go take an online test. Um, I wrote it yesterday. I procrastinated to the last minute. And for some odd reason, it's 17 questions. I don't know why it's 17, but it is. And uh, you take the test, uh, you get a better than 70% grade, and you get a snazzy certificate. You can show your supervisor that you went and did something today. Um, if you don't get a 70%, don't worry. You should loop right back around. You can take the test up to 10 times, and uh, you can find out exactly what you got wrong. It's kind of like a bonus learning exercise because you're going to have to get the right answers to get through it. Uh, in the download section of this class, there are there's really only one download. It's the phonetic alphabet and the phonetic uh, way that we say numbers in the aviation world. And we're going to give you a link to uh, for flight and also the link for continuing education and uh, your tests. So it's interesting when we talk about radio communications on the aviation handheld radios. Um, there is lingering official policy with the FAA from the early days of the UAS programs where it talks about needing to maintain two-way communications with towers and um, aircraft. Those documents go way back to 2013. And today, it is, this is like a very dynamic, fluid uh, topic. There is no official reason for you to communicate. However, in the interest of air safety and also uh, in the interest of not having to worry about people flying above me at busy incident scenes, a quick radio call, a professional radio call, goes a long way to keep everybody operating safely. Uh, a radio call to, most likely it's going to be to a helicopter in the area. And it quickly informs the pilots that you know what you're doing and they don't have to worry about you as much. Uh, and typically it's news helicopters. You will find that they're generally flying about uh, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 feet above a scene. There's no uh, worry about collision or impact with those helicopters. But uh, they will come in and I have had times where they have been lower than that, and they can be uh, over certain scenes, and I don't want to worry about rotor wash. And from the ground, you really can't tell how high they are. So a quick radio call to the helicopter, I'm going to show you and uh, describe exactly what to do, um, just gives everybody a heads up. Now, the other thing is that uh, because I have established relationships with the local news helicopters, there have been times where I have been at an incident scene and they know my call sign. I'm uh, Wake Forest Firebird 1. And they have been able to help me from their vantage point, uh, for example, find a uh, outdoor wildland fire that was dispatched to the wrong address. And I just radioed the helicopter and they went, yeah, it's a mile over to your right. And uh, sometimes we will coordinate airspace. And one time I was flying a, a demonstration event, talked to the helicopter pilot, and we both traded information about what was the the best angle to get a view at this very cluttered scene. So we work together a lot. And a radio call also informs less professional pilots that you're operating in the area around uncontrolled airports for um, seasonal flyers. It's getting to be springtime again, and guys are going to be getting out in the plane that haven't been flying for a while. And uh, you don't want them to get fixated on your aircraft, on your drone, if you're near an uncontrolled airport. You can fly near an uncontrolled airport. In fact, Part 107 pilots can fly up to the airport property, and uh, you may have an incident that you're within a mile of an airport, and I'm going to tell you exactly how to make those radio calls. 
And having the handheld aviation radio with you doesn't mean that you have to transmit on it, but you can monitor local radio traffic as well. It is very helpful. Now, as I said, this, this will sound crazy, but there's no official or FAA-mandated process at this time for UAS pilots to communicate at any scene to coordinate any airspace or to make the airspace safer above an operation. I've been flying at incidents when civilian drones have created issues and distractions, and there is no way to communicate with UAS pilots. There's no common UAS radio frequency like there is for helicopters, and current radio frequencies are becoming so overloaded and congested that the Federal Communications Commission is actually discouraging people from safe radio communications. Uh, this is also going to be a problem when we're trying to advance the field and provide UAS traffic management, UTM, um, that will alert us when other UAS are in the area. We're running out of the frequencies that planes use and that we would use, so the FAA and the FCC is scrambling to come up with a different solution. Right now, you may have heard about ADSB, and it's those two frequencies that are becoming very congested. And actually, um, controllers have told me that sometimes they lose the ADSB signal from the airplanes just because the radio frequencies are just that congested. Between a lack of UAS air traffic management and a communication protocol between pilots, the skies are going to become more congested and hazardous if you and me, if we don't take responsibility for minimizing the risks and creating a safer environment. That is exactly what this webinar is about. Now, there are some facts to remember here, and you know what? They may be on your test. Uh, nobody is required to communicate with you. A, a handheld radio is best within a two-mile range. These are not real powerhouses. They generate about, they send out about five watts. Um, these are better for you than using some sort of vehicle mounted or base station type uh, radio that would transmit further because the only thing that you're really concerned about is what is happening right there in your area. You don't need to broadcast all across the, the state. The helicopter traffic you need to worry about most is law enforcement helicopters and medevac helicopters, which typically fly much lower than the news helicopters. Now, the, the uh, law enforcement helicopters will have the least amount of lights on them. They're trying to be stealthy most of the time. And the medevac helicopters may have been taking off from a scene or a nearby hospital, and they can be 500 feet or so. So pay attention. If you're at a law enforcement scene and there may be a, a helicopter coming inbound and there are news helicopters, monitoring your handheld radio on a frequency I'm going to give you is going to be your best friend to get a heads up. The other best early warning device that you can use if there's low-flying aircraft in your area, helicopters, um, is your ears. If you can hear a helicopter, it is getting nearby enough. You can hear them coming, the thump, 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 thump. Uh, then it is time to pay attention. Now, I had an incident where I was on our, we have an abandoned golf course here in Wake Forest that we use for testing and demo flights. And I was 300 feet AGL with the drone and had to duck down in an emergency because a helicopter, I guess it was a student pilot, um, came over a bank of trees at lower than 300 feet and I had to duck down. So the other thing about helicopters is they can fly lower than 300 feet. Um, they're not bound by the same restrictions that airplanes are. And... Trust me, if you have an airplane that is flying less than 400 feet AGL, it's just on its way to the scene of the crash uh, because no airplane is going to be down that low for the types of things that we're flying. So a handheld aviation radio is typically best. Uh, this is uh, the one that I have, but I would suggest that uh, you shop by price. I have my, all my local frequencies. Can't see it there, I think programmed in there, and uh, the range is limited, so I don't need to worry about overloading the airwaves. The least expensive radio you can have is generally going to do the job. You can buy radios like these uh, on Amazon, or the pilot uh, 
favorite place to shop is Sporties, sporties sporties.com. And just shop by price, okay? Because you just need something that is going to be able to allow you to receive communications and transmit. The Fed, I've been around and around with the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, and they now insist that there is no longer a registration uh, that you need to file in order to operate a handheld radio. These can be easy to use and charge unless you buy the version that uses AA batteries. This one happens to have a lithium um, battery in it that I can easily recharge without having to worry about carrying extra batteries, and I can charge it in the truck, in fact. I prefer these. I, I have another one of these that uses uh, AA batteries, and I think it uses eight batteries, and it makes it heavy, too. Uh, the best radio to have is the one that you have with you. Shop price over fancy features. Now, um, we've got a Several students, a bunch of students that are not in the United States. So this is for U.S. students only. When you're shopping for, and this is important, okay? When you're shopping for an aviation handheld radio, you want to make sure it can receive and transmit. And you also want to make sure that it operates in the 118 to 136.975 megahertz range. On Amazon and other places, I have seen radios advertised um, that operate in a different frequency range, and they're advertised as aviation radios. Those may be the frequencies that are used in other countries, but in the United States, communications is 118 to 136.975. Don't buy a foreign band radio. It won't do you any good in the United States. So... As part of our Part 107 and COA pilot training, we have uh, should have learned the phonetic alphabet. The phonetic alphabet that we use as pilots is different. It's funny because the, the phonetic alphabet the local police department uses and the fire department uses are two different things. But this is the phonetic alphabet. You got to download for it right there. And um, when it comes to numbers, there's been this transition. The FAA wants us to say, uh, if you look at five, for example, here, and they want to say fife um, or tree for three. And uh, I think not many guys are have uh, embraced that. So uh, you'll hear some controllers say it once they get some supervisor that comes through and forces them to say it again. But uh, numbers are pretty straightforward. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and zero. And then uh, the phonetic alphabet. Okay, I have two videos here we're going to play, and they're from two local news helicopter pilots. Here, I think, is the most important tip for you that you won't see anyplace else, which is if you are flying in an area where you have local, you have law enforcement aviation departments, like maybe the state police, your county police, you have uh, news stations that generally fly at, at incident scenes, I would encourage you as much as possible to reach out and advance and uh, just arrange a meeting and go talk to them and coordinate a process. Uh, because I did this, everybody who I operate with uh, knows that uh, the call sign for the Wake Forest Fire Department uh, UAS is Firebird 1. And so we can communicate clearly. We've met each other. We've established exactly what you're going to do. And the two videos that you're going to see here are pilots that I communicate with over incident scenes. So let me load this up for you. First, we're going to meet Eric. Eric is actually uh, going on to be a medevac helicopter pilot. So he's still going to be operating at busy scenes. He's just going to be flying lower. So there's no sound. You'll see the question, then you'll see the answer. Communication is key, at least starting out. So when a news helicopter or a medevac helicopter or a law enforcement helicopter is mounted to a scene, if we know ahead of time that there's going to be drones on the scene, that helps us already be on the extra lookout for the drones. Now, I will say that there can be a problem where you have inundation of information. So too much communication is also bad, right? So all of the helicopters, we're generally going to be communicating 
on the VHF low band, the aviation frequency, we're going to be on 123025. That's the helicopter air to air frequency. Air to air frequency. You can usually reach us on that if you need to contact us for something. That's the that's the frequency that we're going to be talking on to each other. So when helicopters, news helicopters are orbiting scenes, we try to stagger altitudes, but we always talk to each other, try to establish 180 degrees in a pattern to keep that horizontal spacing from each other. Um, I will say the law enforcement helicopters tend to operate lower. They try to get up closer to the scenes. Generally, the news helicopters, we're going to be up at 1,500 feet to 2,000 feet, um, especially on a scene um, that law enforcement is involved. We want to back off and give as much space to the emergency services as possible. The altitudes that the drones are operating, it's less of an issue for us as far as a collision hazard. Being 400 feet and below, if we're at 400 feet in a helicopter, there's probably a problem. You know, altitude, uh, usually a landmark that you can reference. I'm standing next to this white water tower with the town of such and such written on it, something like that. Um, even if we don't have communication with you, if there's some visual indication that there's a drone operator down there, it can be like a brightly colored flag, something that when we're up in the sky, if we have a camera, even if we don't, we can kind of focus our eyes on it and say, oh, that may be a drone operator. Or, you know, a vehicle that's marked, something like that, where we can, where we'll be able to tell visually that there's a drone in the air. We'll be on that, that have that extra set of, of eyes on it. Um, it usually does not distract us, right? So aircraft are, you know, normal, you know, occupied aircraft are equipped with flashing strobes. And so that's generally what we're on the lookout for, flashing lights. Cell phone towers, microwave towers have the same flashing lights on them. So that's what we're on the lookout for. Our eyes kind of naturally gravitate towards those flashing lights. So it's not so much of a distraction um, at night. We can sometimes lose track of all the flashing lights, especially if we're on a scene with emergency services. There's a lot of police, there's a lot of fire. You know, That's usually what we're looking for to find the scene. Now we found all the flashing lights, and now we're trying to pick out the Ohio Patrol helicopter and his flashing light. He usually has most of his lights off, and then the other news helicopters and all the flashing lights. So uh, not too much of a distraction, though. You know, really, the more lighting, the better. The more visible, the better. If it were me, I'd paint every drone bright orange or neon green or yellow or something. Uh, yes. Um, I will say you're the only one that I've directly communicated with on the radio, um, but we have had information relayed to us when over a scene that be advised such and such department has a drone in the air, and we would focus in on the camera, and, and we'd actually, sometimes we could find it, um, but it's very difficult to see something that small. I guess we'll start with a bad radio call. So, you know, hey, helicopter, I'm right below you. Um, that means nothing to me, um, especially from the ground. Anywhere within a mile of being underneath me, uh, you know, a mile laterally, it looks like you're directly underneath me, but you may not be underneath me. So when you say underneath me, I think you're directly underneath me, even if you might not be. So uh, if you're on the helicopter frequency and you're at a particular scene and you know there's helicopters above you, that limited range that you have um, on that radio actually helps you in some ways, and that even if you say things that don't make any sense, you're only going to confuse the people within that couple of mile radius of your radio, right? You're not going to be transmitting to everybody across the state of North Carolina. No, they won't be able to pick you up. So a, a good radio call to on something like helicopters in the vicinity of downtown Chapel Hill. This is a drone operator. I go by this call sign. I'm standing on the north side of the water tower with Chapel Hill written on it. I have a flashing red beacon on my drone. I'm staying below 400 feet. Yes, I will generally say that if, if, a, if a drone pilot um, has the wherewithal to make that call and to notice, for instance, that there's helicopters orbiting above his equipment, um, that he's probably Maybe I would say probably better trained uh, than some of the drone operators that are out there. So yeah, I do have a little bit more confidence. For us, just knowing that 
a drone is down there and knowing that the drone operator sees us is usually all that we need to know. Um, no, so drone operators don't have the authority to order air, aircraft out of the airspace. Um, the airspace is public use airspace, um, so we do all have to sort of work together um, and we share the airspace. Um, in fact, news helicopters and other operators should always give way to law enforcement and emergency services aircraft. Um, so. Uh, sort of like we referenced earlier, if, if I see that there's a highway patrol helicopter or there's an EMS helicopter inbound, a lot of times the news helicopters will clear the area, will climb way up or will go a couple miles away. The, uh, the, uh, the news station will always understand we need to give way to the emergency services to allow them to do their jobs. So. No, we're not required to answer them regardless. Uh, and in fact, you may make a call and a perfectly good call, and we may just have our hands tied. We're doing a lot of stuff. We're using both hands, both feet. We're already usually talking on two to three different radios at a time. Uh, so we may not even be able to make that call. And if we do make that call, it may not be to you. We may be on that same radio, but we may be talking to two other helicopters in the area, which for us is our primary concern. It's the big metal that's flying around up there. All right, that's Eric. Uh, a couple questions came through. And uh, both excellent questions. One was, is the call sign some, something that needs to be registered with the FAA or is it created ad hoc? So the call sign uh, that I have, Wake Forest Firebird 1, is one that uh, all of the parties here locally uh, came into an agreement about that is who we are. And so it is not anything that is registered, but it is understood local, locally. When I go someplace else, and I have to fly, uh, I refer to myself as Wake Forest Firebird 1, unless there is a conflict with some local aircraft there. The other question Thomas asked is, the frequency 123.025 nationwide or only locally in North Carolina? That is the FAA air-to-air -air, uh, frequency assigned for helicopters. So helicopters are monitoring that and uh, listening to it, and we just get to talk to them on the ground. There's no other common frequency. That is the official frequency. So it is nationally? It is nationally, yes. It is through the United States. Um, if you're in Greece or one of the other countries listening here, you'll have to check with your aviation authority and see if there is an assigned frequency. So now we're going to talk to Dave. Dave is actually the pilot with the... Uh, competing news helicopter news station here in town and Dave also uh, used to be a pilot up in Manhattan flying in that very busy airspace up there so he's used to dealing with conflicts absolutely always concerned about him because largely we can't see him uh, we don't know when they're going to be up. I know when the, the area they're supposed to be at, but sometimes people don't follow the rules. Um, it's great working with folks that are active on the radio, let us know they're there. Because when we're above the drone looking down on a scene, you just get lost in the ground a lot of the time. Doesn't matter how many lights are on or what color it is. If it blends into the background, it's just very difficult to spot. If it blends into the background, it's just very difficult to spot. Twenty three zero two five is helicopter air to air frequency. We're always on that as news helicopters and EMS. Anytime you see one of us above, it would be absolutely great if you gave us a holler. Because chances are, again, we're not going to see you. What would be most helpful is, hey, helicopter with some sort of description. Hey, red helicopter. Hey, news helicopter. Whatever the case may be, anything you see. Hey, just so you know, we're operating a drone in this area and give us an altitude where you're at. That's massively helpful. At that point, we're going to work with you. We're going to tell you, OK, I'm at this altitude. I'm not going to go below this. That way there's no interference and everyone's happy. I'm not going to go below this. That way there's no interference and everyone's happy. It makes me feel a whole lot better. I mean, I'm still going to keep looking. I would Ideally, I'm going to try and keep you in sight the whole time. But it does make me feel a lot more at ease.
I'm not there to save lives. I'm there just to cover the story. So I'm probably just going to go higher and give you all the room you need to work. Uh, that's the way we generally operate. We have a pretty good camera. We can see pretty far away. So we can give you plenty of room, and everyone's happy that way. Well, we're all flying, and a lot of us have a little bit of type A in us. Uh, the reality is, no, no one owns it. No one can tell the other person to go away. Unless the TFR is posted, the helicopter can legally be there. Uh, it's much, much easier if everyone just talks and works together. But, no, you can't kick us out. You can ask, and we can, we'll absolutely work with you, but no one can kick the other guy out. Hey, Red News Helicopter, I see you're above me. I'm flying a drone worth Wake Forest Fire Department, operating in this area, covering this scene. I'm going to be below X altitude, approximately this far from the location. It's just a radio, it's just talking. No one's going to get on there and rag on you. Just remember, push the button, wait half a second. There's a little bit of a delay. Uh, and then also don't ramble on. Keep it short and concise. Speak clearly. That's about it. Absolutely not. I'm listening to three radios in the helicopter, coordinating with the uh, photographers, coordinating with the news station. So it can get pretty busy in there. And depending on where we're at, I may be working with airspace with you know, local control towers or anything that may be going on. I'll get back with you. Uh, but sometimes it may not get an immediate response. If you don't hear back from you know, the pilot within a reasonable amount of time, say 60 seconds, two minutes, sure, give him another call. But don't get irritated right off the bat, please. So before we get to a scene, we typically will have an address or GPS coordinates. We're working on a timely manner, so we're usually screaming in. Uh, within one or two miles, we get a location on the scene visually. Uh, at that point, I start coordinating with the photographer so they can find the scene with the camera. They are then coordinating with the news station, making sure that they're receiving the video. I'm hearing all of that communication in my headset. Coming up on scene, I'm also looking for any other news helicopters, potentially any other, other uh, obstacles in the area. Um, at that point, we typically set up into an orbit right off the bat, get a lay of the land, and then from there, we'll start to decide where we need to be for whatever shot works for us. We're all working on the same frequency, that 23025, same air-to-air -air for all helicopters. Um, we'll see each other coming in, and we start communicating immediately. Typically, the news helicopters, we work together on a daily basis, so we're comfortable working in close proximity. We've built a trust there. Law enforcement typically flies pretty low, well below us. So that kind of takes care of itself. We'll communicate with them, say, hey, shot, you know, whatever helicopter you're in, um, I'm going to be up this altitude. I see you down there. We'll give you plenty of room to work because, again, I want to give law enforcement every opportunity they can to do their job the best. And that usually works out pretty good. Everyone just kind of separates themselves vertically within the airspace. Biggest thing I think for drone guys is it's a lot easier for you to see up, see what you're operating, see another aircraft than it is top looking down. Uh, top looking down, it's a lot harder to spot what you're operating down below me. So keep that in mind. Uh, just because you can see everything and you see that, oh, there's plenty of separation, doesn't mean that there necessarily may be. Uh, different line of sight changes how perspective looks quite a bit. Um, also, keep an eye on altitudes. I know the areas where you're allowed to operate up to. Make sure you're within those, please. There's a, they're there for reasons. Of course, happens all the time. Plenty of folks should be on the radio, aren't on the radio. And when you can't communicate with them, you have to assume you have no idea what they're going to do. So that really changes how you operate. Back on and uh, pull up the last half of this presentation. 
Apologies for the echo. It's actually, I think, one of the first times that I've had a lot of uh, audio with a video presentation. Now we know I need to turn off my microphone. So um, 123.025, write it down, carry it with you. If you have an aviation handheld radio, that is really the, your, your guardian frequency that you need to remember. So when it comes to communicating with helicopters primarily, uh, don't overcomplicate things. Like you heard Dave say, keep it simple. Your primary use of the radio is in to inform others and create safer skies at an incident. Once I communicate with Dave or Eric, uh, red helicopter, blue helicopter at a scene, uh, we both know that we're there. I don't need to think about them anymore. If there's going to be an incident after my communication, he's got some problem that I can't control at all. So uh, a quick call brings confidence and it just takes something that would divert your attention that you might have to focus on and it just moves it out of the way entirely. For helicopters, wait until you can hear them and you know they're approaching. You don't need to make a radio call when it's just a faint thump, thump, thump out there. Wait till they're uh, real close and you can hear them well. Uh, your transmission will be for a purpose. You don't need to say, hey, Dave, or anything else. You need to keep it professional, short, and sweet. For operations near uncontrolled airports, especially on the landing end side of the active runway, you will be broadcasting in the blind primarily. For local control towers, it is best to call them on the telephone unless you have a prior arrangement and call sign to use on a specific frequency. Here in Raleigh, North Carolina, if I need to make uh, contact on the radio with our control tower, then I would contact them on the ground frequency, not the tower frequency, but that is something that you can talk to your local tower if you're flying near control towers and coordinate a process. Uh, there are few or no rules about this. It's about being a professional, establishing a pro local process, and then uh, making sure everybody's on the same page. So when you push to talk on the radio, make sure you just pause for a second. Pause is your friend. Don't rush to transmit. Um, and, you know, if you've just turned on your radio, we have a chat question here. If you've just turned on your radio, then, you know, wait 15 seconds and monitor to, uh, before you transmit. So Mike says, we have permission to operate from the local airport, non-towered. Is it advisable to use the Unicom frequency to announce? Great question. Good segue. It's coming up. Helicopters may have their hands and feet busy when they're approaching an incident scene, and um, they may not respond right straight away, as you heard Dave and Eric say. All right, so here's a sample helicopter radio call, and it is... Red helicopter above the fire in Rollsville. This is the Wake Forest Fire Department drone pilot. I'm actually Firebird 1. Um, I'm currently flying over this incident and will remain below 400 feet AGL. If it's at night, I'll remind them, you may see the red and white strobes on the drone. If they can see that and they see the red and white, they know that's me. They just take that out of their concern. And I'm reaching them on 123.025. So... Transmission usually is, um, hey, Red News Helicopter, I'm operating above the incident in Wake Forest. I see you nearby. I am below 400 feet AGL and operating on the north side of this scene. And that's all I need to say. And then they'll, they'll come back and say, uh, um, Roger, uh, uh, Firebird 1, we have you in sight. Something like that. We don't need to talk any more after that. So... You're flying near an uncontrolled airport. This is for Robert and Mike. There's an application. Pam's going to send you the link here for ForeFlight. Um, my favorite aviation application that I use on my phone is ForeFlight. There are all sorts of drone applications that are out there um, and all sorts of packages, but I like using ForeFlight on my phone, and I use it in the airplane. I use it for the drone. I use it. Um, for zooming in and telling me exactly where I am and finding information out. And I also use it for logging all of my flights in the airplane and the drone. Uh, I am a firm believer in ForeFlight. They have a $99 a year package. Um, and ForeFlight will give you much more information, I find, than any of those drone applications out there. I don't care who they're made by. 
So for example, the thing that you're seeing here on the right side of your screen is a screenshot from ForeFlight on my phone for a particular airport. And we can see that the runways here are 05 and 23. And most importantly, we have the weather uh, frequency here. And we have a telephone number that we can call it on the AWOS. Uh, and we can get what the winds are. And if the winds are blowing 21, for example, then we know they're probably landing 23. Uh, we also have here the CTAF, which is the common traffic advisory frequency, which Robert mentioned. If I'm operating within two miles, uh, two miles or less of an uncontrolled airport, I am monitoring the CTAF. Uh, and I'm also listening with my ears to hear if there's any, any aircraft that is coming near my position. Most importantly, if I'm operating near the end of the active runway, then I will make radio calls, blind radio calls, and we're gonna talk about it here. So, here's how you make a CTAF radio call for those of you who may not have done it a whole lot. Uh, we're gonna use the airport Triangle North Executive. That is the official name for KLHZ. And using ForeFlight, you can use your fingers and spread them apart and map exactly from the airport to where you are. It'll tell you the uh, bearing and the exact distance where you are so you can transmit information with some sort of knowledge on it. So in this case, it would be uh, Triangle North Executive Traffic. The Wake Forest Fire Department drone is currently conducting emergency flight operations 0.4 miles south of the airport below 400 feet. Triangle North Executive Traffic. So you start and end the um, you start and end the communication with the official airport name and traffic. Not the county it's in, not the city it's in, the official airport name. That's what we're listening for in the airplane for uh, traffic that pertains to us. When we're flying and there's an airport that uses a common traffic advisory frequency, that's one frequency for all communications there, that frequency is not used just at that one airport. It's used at different airports across the, the state. And when you're flying, you can pick up radio traffic from airports that are 50 miles away. So as a pilot in the airplane, I'm listening for the airport name because it's just a whole lot of chatter in the background. If you hear an airplane in the airport area or on the ground in, or in the air nearby, you can repeat the blind radio call every few minutes. Otherwise, there's no need to transmit. You will either see an airport moving on the airport if you can see it, or you will hear it starting up, you will hear it getting ready to take off, or whatever, then you can worry about transmitting. Otherwise, you don't need to worry about it. Randy asks, does ForeFlight have a section to keep track of multi-drone service? We currently use, uh, it tracks all our flights. No, it doesn't. Uh, ForeFlight is a professional pilot application. It is not a drone application, but, um, it keeps all the FAA logs for you as the pilot. You are the registered user of it. It is not a multi-user thing. You purchase an individual subscription and you keep track of all of your flights for your FAA reporting requirements. All right, so if you don't have ForeFlight and you're looking at a sectional, uh, for those who are Part 107 and COA pilots, you should all know the information that's on a sectional. Here's the exact same airport. And here's the information the sectional tells us. If we look back over here at ForeFlight, we will see it said the airport frequency for the AWOS is 118.325, and it gives us the telephone number. The sectional only gives us the frequency. It doesn't give us the telephone number, so we can't call. Um, I find the telephone numbers to be extremely helpful for the automated information because it allows me to monitor different parts of the county um, in the morning when I get up, I might call and figure out what the weather is doing out there, and it gives me nearly real-time weather. Uh, also, we can see on this sectional, there are a bunch of numbers here. It says 368, that's the airport altitude above sea level, so that's MSL, mean sea level. Uh, the next one you don't really need to worry about, the length is 5,500. Here we go. It has the C in the filled-in circle there. So that indicates that is the CTAF, the Common Traffic Advisory Frequency, and it tells us it's 123.0. If you're using some sort of application or you actually have a paper sectional map that you carry around, the legend is your friend. 
even when you're taking your check ride in the airplane, uh, you can look at the legend if you need help, and the legend is always there to help you. There are so many little dots and circles and squigglies and everything else, and that little white box there on the sectional is exactly what it says in the legend for those sorts of things. All right, we're heading towards the end here. For those in North Carolina, this is the link for you to take uh, to fill out the form for your continuing education credits. psflight.org slash CE. Pam just posted it in the chat section there. I am posting another poll. This is where you can tell me how badly I sucked in doing this class. This is my first time doing it. There we go. Give me some feedback, honest feedback about the class. Let me know. So any questions before you take the test? It's a 17-question test, and you're going to get uh, your certificate because you will pass. I just keep looping around. and uh, you, you should also get an email that shows you the questions that you got wrong, and you can use that as a study guide as well. So let's see. We got a couple of chat questions going. Um, oh. You're welcome, James. All right, so I'm going to give you my email address again. Make sure you whitelist this in your email software, sroad at wakeforestfire.com, and you can always email me, and when I email back, you'll have my phone number. You can always call me. A lot of guys do, and um, you should always reach out to me if you have a question. I My goal is to give you a dead, honest answer that I can based on practical experience, and I have been a certificated airplane pilot since 1988. In fact, uh, I was telling somebody just this morning that I had my first run-in with an unmanned uh, aircraft system in 1988 because I was flying right after I got my pilot's license and almost got hit by an RC aircraft. So um, unmanned aircraft have been a problem for a long time. Here is the link to take the test, psflight.org slash test dash rc dash 17 psflight.org slash test dot rc dash 17 and that is it so i'm going to be um you can go off and take the test i'll be hanging out here in the chat um and for a little bit and if you have any questions or something i'd be happy to answer them through the chat so chris says uh, before we go can you address if you need an FCC license to talk on the aviation handheld? Uh, oh, yeah, Robert, Robin says, what about that tiny drone you tested? Now, where is it? I, Chris, I'm going to answer your question, but I just happen to have this tiny drone here. This is uh, I'm writing an article about it right now for AOPA. This little sucker was ama amazing on a tactical exercise we did yesterday. It's 100 bucks. Uh, Chris... So the FCC in the past has said that you need a restricted radio telephone license, and there's actually a process for applying for it. However, now they say that um, you are not required to have one. Uh, there are so many people that use handheld radios, the guy at the local airport, the flight instructor that might be talking to the student, uh, the ramp guy. I mean, there are so many people that use them. Um, it's just out of hand at this point. So... If you wanted to try to apply for an official, I actually have a radio telephone license. Um, but if you want to try to apply for one, that's what you're looking for. You go to the FCC to apply restricted radio telephone license. You pay 70 bucks. It's good for the rest of your life. Uh, nobody will ever look at it. Okay. Any last chat messages? Oh, you are very welcome. Okay. Well, go take your test. And I am going to stop the camera here, but I'll be hanging out in the chat for a few minutes if you need me. See you next time.